Okay. So it's my pleasure today to welcome our speakers to this session. And our first speaker will be Monica Crump, who's going to speak about transformative experience of implementing a next generation library system. Now, Monica is head of collections in NUIG with responsibility for collection development and management, including discoverability and accessibility of library collections. And in previous roles in NUIG, Monica has been head of information access and learning services, head of bibliographic services and collection management librarian. Uh, prior to this, she held various library and non-library related roles, um, including researcher um, on EU funded projects, web editor and a project manager with software company. Uh, outside of work, she juggles her three teenage boys, uh, social life, keeps them on the straight and narrow. Um, she loves to travel, is studying French, and she enjoys good food and wine, which she says she offsets by running occasionally. Okay, so that's uh, Monica. Now, um, our second presentation is realising the true heritage of RCSI through transformational change. And we have two presenters, first one being Mary Doherty. Mary has been in special collections in RCSI for three decades now um, and been part of the transformation of RCSI library over that time. She's dealt with all aspects of RCSI antiquarian books their provenance, preservation, their arrangement, and most importantly, their exploitation. She publishes on historical bibliography, Irish medical history, with particular interest in the historical geography of medical Dublin. She's on the editorial board of the Irish Journal of Medical Science, is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Medicine in Ireland, active in particular in its section on the history of medicine, and she was president of that section for a couple of years. She's a consultant contributor to the Encyclopedia of Ireland, that was 2003, contributor to the Dictionary of Irish Biography, 2009, um, and she's been very active with the LAI's Rare Books Group, holding chairperson roles and secretary roles over the years. She was on the Connell um, uh, Collections Preservation Committee, particularly working on the Collaborative Storage Group work there, and she's currently on Connell's Unique and Distinct Collections Committee, and also serves on the Library and Heritage Committee of RCSI, or CPI, sorry. And then uh, co-presenting with Mary Doherty, we have Kate Kelly, who's Director of Library Services at RCSI. And she has spent most of her career in health and health related um, libraries, both in Ireland and in the US. And she has worked as a consultant for the Irish government and various public service organizations in Ireland. Prior to her career in libraries, Kate worked with um, emigrants and homeless agencies in the nonprofit sector. She's a fellow of the LAI. She's chair of the LAI Professional Standards Committee and she is a, a, a member of Unlarlan Editorial Board. She's secretary to uh, the Training and Education Special Interest Group of EAHL, the European Association for Health Information and Libraries. And she is also a distinguished member of the US Academy of Health Information Professionals and serves on the Library and Archives Committee of the Royal Dublin Society. So our third and the final uh, presentation is Rip It Up and Start Again, Redefining Our Collections to Redefine Our Role, and that's Hugh Murphy from Minute University, and he's been there since 2010, having worked previously in University College Dublin and the National Library of Ireland. His, Hugh's current role involves um, the new Collections and Content Department in Minute University, which takes responsibility for all library collections as well as the associated process to processes such as collection management. Since 2005, he has acted as an occasional lecturer in the School of Information and Communication Studies in UCD, and he's now also lecturing on Minute's new archival uh, master's program. And uh, fair juice to you, Hugh, pursuing uh, a doctorate now, a PhD, in early uh, 19th century history, how he finds time, I don't know. 
but his main professional interests lie in the areas of collection development, library buildings, and resource description. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Monica. Thank you. Hello. Uh, it's a really tough act following up on Jim, so sorry, you know, I'm not going to be able to reach those lofty heights of uh, all those stimulating things that Jim had to say. Um, I'm coming down to the more mundane about a library management system, which is lying at the core of everything we do in a library, and every member of library staff throughout a library uses that library system to do their work, so it's pretty fundamental. In NUI Galway, we had worked with the Aleph Library Management System since 1999, and this system, which had been really cutting edge at the time of implementation, was designed for a print world, when libraries were worried about acquiring, describing, making accessible, print hard copy books, and the e-world was really only just beginning to emerge at that time. As well as that, the system was based on client-server architecture. Again, it was fairly radical at the time of implementation. I remember Dynix and uh, DOS-based and so on. Um, but it was meant that software had to be installed on everyone's PC, that there were local soft servers that had to be maintained and looked after, um, and a huge amount of technical expertise was required within the library just to keep the library management system going. Um, the world changed completely since 1999, as you all know. The worlds of libraries have completely been transformed. So we have had to, in that time, stretch, adapt, and add to Aleph to make it do what we wanted it to do for us. And all of this meant that we were dealing with an increased amount of complexity. Um, we were adding new systems to do new things to do with E. We were uh, have spreadsheets. We had another system to do this. We had PDFs over here. We had a reading list system then because Aleph didn't do that. We had Islandora. We have DSpace. We have all sorts of different systems all over the place. And that level of complexity, of course, means more and more and more staff time being spent maintaining these different systems, more money being spent paying for all these different systems, and a horrendous amount of complexity, which meant that the systems didn't really talk to each other that well, so you were never really quite able to do things the way you wanted to do them, or quite as well as you would have liked to do them. It was increasingly clear to us that it was time for a change. Um, all of those systems mean duplication of effort, which means there's too much scope for error. So somebody gets it right on this system, but it's wrong on the other one. So the SFX knows we have this journal, but hey, Aleph doesn't, so uh, things don't go well. And you're duplicating effort. Also, we, because of the stretching we did, and we were very lucky to have excellent technical staff, so we had uh, great so local solutions, but it meant we weren't very upgrade-proof. So when upgrades came to our system, we weren't always very successful in upgrading because of some tweak or expansion or improvement that we had done. So it was time for change, as I say. Um, what we wanted to do, I'm sure anyone who's been involved in the implementation of a library management system will know that it's a massive and complex project. It's really, really expensive in terms of staff time, and I don't know that people, you know, you look for the money to build the system, to pay for the system, which is also a cost, but the staff time is a much bigger cost, actually, if you added up all the hours and salaries and so on. Um, so we didn't want to just change our tools. We wanted the implementation of the system to be completely transformative and to allow us to just change the way we work completely and really gain the efficiencies that we could see should be possible with a new system. So we wanted one single management to manage all the resources, not E over here, P over here, digital over there, so one single system. We wanted a unification between resource management and discovery. So I had had some frustration, some of my colleagues are here and will know that I've gone on about this a bit, that catalogers look in Aleph and they see it's beautiful in Aleph, it's working perfectly, but it's not working for the users at the front end. So we wanted something that would bring those two things a little bit more closely together so that staff could experience what the users would experience and the issues that the users might experience. We wanted more automation of manual processes and I was delighted that Jim mentioned um, that we needed to get rid of redundant inefficient library operations. I thought, oh, yay, that's a my slide too. That's exactly what we wanted to do. Um, you know, anything that a computer could do, the computer should do. We have so many changing user expectations and so many exciting things we're trying to do. We don't have any new staff or very few new staff, so we need to be able to use our staff for those new things and not for doing anything at all. If a computer can do it, why are we paying somebody to sit doing it was my mantra in any case. Um, we also wanted to integrate better with external systems, so we did have some integration, but we wanted to make that more seamless. 
Uh, and one of the big changes that I was very keen to get was devolved responsibility to functional areas. And I'm going to come back to this a few times. So we wanted infrastructure in a system where people who were in charge of a functional area, like, for example, a cataloger, acquisitions librarian, e-resources librarian, could have full responsibility for that system, that they didn't need to have a degree in computer science, that they didn't need to be going in the back end and tinkering with the engine, that they could take full responsibility. Um, we also wanted a hosted solution so we didn't have to have somebody minding babysitting uh, servers and so on. We have lots of exciting changes happening in, in NUI Galway, um, moving into digital publishing and innovations in digital scholarship and so on. Why would we want the people who could be leading us there and pushing us forward to new futures there to be sitting minding a server and doing upgrades and patches and so on? So instead, we have a hosted solution that uh, we pay somebody else to do that. It's part of the service. So we wanted, in, in, just to put it shortly, to simplify, to automate, and to devolve. Um, just looking a bit at some of the process we went through, the first stage, of course, to get a new system was to actually procure it. And I guess most people here know what a nightmare procurement has become um, and what a long and slow process it can be. Um, but actually, we, there are a lot of phases. My colleague Evelyn led this project, and I'm sure she probably wouldn't agree that it was a great, great project to do. Um, but there's a lot of benefits out of that long, slow process that I'm still seeing today. So we spent a long time gathering our requirements. We went we had systems vendors come and demonstrate to us. We went on site visits. We tried to learn from others. And I should say, I don't know if Laura Shanahan is in the room, but I know she's at the conference. Uh, Laura was working in, at University of Edinburgh when we were undertaking this work. And they had been out to tender shortly before. And they really, really generously shared their requirements with us. And that starting point for us was just it completely made our, our requirement specification a success because we were coming from not from a blank sheet if you like I think that would have been way more challenging so in the same way we're really happy to share our requirements with others because it, it definitely makes it an easier job but our main and underlying requirement was that we weren't looking for like with like so it was it was a challenge and we had to question each other encourage each other and um, and say you know you're just saying you wanted to do what you can currently do with the old system what's the point in changing no what what would you like in a mad dream world what would you really love it to be able to do and um, so we really challenged each other questioned each other and um, i should say we also delegated that that requirement specification to the functional owners so it wasn't done by a systems team Team per se, everybody who was in charge of an area and their teams had a say in what they would like, dream, what would you like a new system to do? So everyone was encouraged to really reach for the stars. So this process, I should say, took 10 months, right? So don't go into this thinking you'll have it done in a few weeks. It took 10 months to go from beginning to having our requirements specified. Um, and at that point, then we were ready to publish uh, an invitation to tender. Just to, to clarify what I'm going on about, because I keep talking about functional areas and functional owners. So these were our functional areas. So some of them are very obvious, resource description and metadata ma data management, cataloging in old speak, and um, acquisitions, budget management and ILL, print fulfillment, you can see them all there. So we had owners for each of these areas who were responsible for requiring specifications, specifying requirements even, um, and later on for implementation within their areas as well, which you'll see in a minute. And um, our requirements were huge. We had 222 business requirements spread over 16 tabs of a spreadsheet. Each business requirement had between one and five evaluation questions. The vendors who submitted tenders to our invitation to tender must have cursed us from on high when they saw it because we asked a lot of questions. Um, but it really helped us to evaluate really, really well exactly who or whether the vendors were going to be able to meet our requirements. And um, the other thing I should say is that a lot of those requirements we kind of knew that they weren't in any of the systems at the moment. Um, so we would have had a lot of discussion about, well, why put it in when we know none of them do it? But I felt really strongly that we want vendors to see this is a unique opportunity for all the vendors in the market who are interested in our business to see what we expect of them. And if they can't do it today, I really hope that they've gone off to tell the developers, this is what you need to be working on. This is what libraries want. Um, and I think if all libraries going out to tender for systems are saying these things, be ambitious, don't talk about what 
what you think they can do today, talk about what you want them to do tomorrow, then eventually we'll all get the systems that we really want and that do everything that we need. So this is what our spreadsheet looked like, one little chunk of it just to show you. It was very, very small, hard to read, <laughs> on millions of pages. Um, but like I say, it really helped us to evaluate. You'll see, I, I don't know if you can actually read it, but the last column there is had a weighting for each area. So not only did we specify requirements, but we said which of them were most important to us. And that allowed us to do the evaluations extremely easily and efficiently and to know that we were picking the best vendor for us. So that whole process from publishing an invitation to tender, to doing evaluations, to negotiating contract terms, took another 12 months. So we had thought we'd be live. You know, once we st started off the procurement process, we thought we'd be live in 12 months. We hadn't even picked a system in 12 months. So uh, it's a long, slow process. And again, I would say that I think it was worth the time that we spent. Um, one of the reasons being that we got the system that, that we're very happy with. But secondly, that I think that transformative thinking had really started and grown in us during this whole process. So to have people who had relied on a system team and a system team whose job it was to support the system, to go from that to, no, actually, it's your baby, you're in charge of it, is a huge transformation. But because we'd had this process of you must specify requirements, no, you must evaluate your area, no, actually, you're in charge of implementing your area too, over that period of time meant that transformative thinking had, start, had really kicked in. So finally a green light, uh, and we picked the Ex Libris system, ALMA. And I'm not going to go on a huge amount about ALMA, one of the reasons being that the speaker uh, specifications say do not go on about particular vendors and so on. Um, but also because, you know, what I want to talk about is really more the transformative aspects uh, from a people point of view rather than the system. So just to make that clear. Okay, so implementation then kick-started, and I was given the job of leading the implementation, because Evelyn was broken from the procurement, I think. <laughs> um, and we had a 10-month project plan, so we started in March 2017, and a Apparently, the project finished in January 2018, although it doesn't feel very finished, I must admit. Um, again, functional owners were fully responsible for their areas. Uh, we had external support for integration from our university systems team and from any third-party systems that we were integrating with. Um, we also had a consultant to help us with that integration. Uh, the system vendor, Ex Libris, also had a project team uh, and they had a project plan. And when I met them first, I spoke to them first, I said, oh, your project plan is lovely, but guess what? I have a bigger project plan and yours sits in here and mine goes either side. Because what I really wanted was that when I knew that when they arrived, they would be, here's the plan, here's what you have to do, and it would be bum, 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 bum straight away. So I wanted us to have a phase before that of preparing, of cleaning up our data, of getting everything the way we thought it should be, of reading ourselves into the whole system, looking at their webinars, reading the documentation before they ever arrived so that we could make the most use of them while they were available to us in the project. And that was worth doing. And the whole thing was overseen by a project manager, which was me, a project officer, and a project board, which all sounds very formal, but it was good to have that structure in place to keep us on track. Um, Okay, so the objectives of the project. Most of these you would think uh, are fairly obvious. We wanted to migrate data from our old system to our new. We wanted to configure the system. If you've ever been involved, these are really standard. I suppose the ones I just want to highlight are the ones that are a bit different in terms of getting the transformation that we wanted. So to maximize automation and efficiency, for example. Um, staff and end user training we were always going to need, but we were th seeing it as being an even bigger deal because we weren't just teaching them how to use a different set of tools. We wanted them to have a whole new way of working. Um, and then the structures for ongoing development and support. Again, the whole goal that we wanted was to free up our technical staff to do exciting new things, not to be babysitting a system. So we needed a totally different structure for, for support and ongoing development of the system. So just to spotlight a little bit on data, first of all, I'm not going to go into every aspect that, of the implementation because we'd be here all day, um, but the data I think is worth highlighting. The picture there is a little boy looking underneath a bed, and I have three sons, as mentioned. I know what horrors lurk under beds or can lurk under beds. I didn't know what I was talking about. When you do a system migration, a data migration, despite us having had three months of data cleanup, we thought, before we started, throughout the project, 
we kept on finding more data that was erroneous or wrong or incorrect or missing something key. Um, so just be warned, like moving, it's like a massive spring clean, which is really nice when you're finished, but during it, it's really horrendous. Um, we had bib records had been deleted, but the items had been left hanging in the system. So Alma didn't know what to do with them. Aleph didn't seem to care, but Alma didn't, you know, was like, oh, this is wrong. We had incorrect location codes, some of them dating back to Dynex. So when we gone from Dynex to Aleph, but they'd never been spotted or never been fixed. We had incorrect or missing um, item statuses and so on and so forth. And a lot of it was human error. So again, being a mammy of three boys, I try not to let people in work see the mammy really too often. It was very hard not to do a, what the hell are you doing? How can people have made so many mistakes? This is just horrendous. Um, and I had to keep pausing and saying, this is 17 years of human error. 17 years is a long time. And we'd say things like, oh, I'm sure it was somebody who's now left or whatever. I knew it wasn't. Um, but I did do a few, enough freak outs, I hope, that people know that our shiny new baby system is not going to have these errors in the future. And, and you know, I, I plan on doing once a year kind of trolls to see if I find something with, you know, unassigned location and errors to try and keep on top of it because you know I certainly had no idea how much bad data we had in there and the key thing beneath the bad data is that those books were undiscoverable to users and there were hundreds and thousands of them maybe not hundreds and thousands there were thousands of them that were undiscoverable to users we may as well have thrown those books in the bin because the bad data on the system meant that no user was ever ever going to find them and if they found them they wouldn't be able to check them out so uh, yeah it was probably good to be a bit naggy the next spotlight I'd like to look at is the workflows. So this again, remember, our major objective was transformation. So we didn't want to take our ways of working and our procedures in the old way and just transplant them onto the new system. And um, every single functional owner, so the acquisitions librarian, cataloger, et cetera, et cetera, were told, redesign your workflows. Do all, we did all the training on Alma. We looked at how other libraries did their, their business with it. And then we designed our workflows. Then we came into a room with our consultant from Ex Libris and with each other and demonstrated the workflows to each other. And again, we challenged, we questioned, we encouraged. We said, why have you got that step? What's the purpose of that step? Or, you know, could that bit not be automated? It seems like something that should be automated. And bit by bit, we be, we, the workflows became better and better. Um, um, we still don't think we're there yet, though, I would say. Uh, we are live since just before Christmas, so five months in. Uh, and over the summer, we're hoping to, again, relook at the workflows and have staff show us how they do their, their work on a, on a daily basis and then question and say, well, why? and why and why? And, you know, what benefit is it adding? And just see, can we streamline things a little bit more? I'm going to go back a bit because Laura has just come into the room and I thanked you profusely earlier on and you missed it. So I just want to thank you for your requirements. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> So again, we were hoping to really reach for the stars. So much effort had gone into the project. You've heard about over two years so far. We needed to make sure that we were going to get some benefits from it. And in terms of specifically in acquisitions, just as an example, we had been fairly automated and we were really very proud of our acquisitions workflows because we used EDI and we were fully shelf ready and so on. Um, but it still involved a lot of staff collecting files, putting them in, sending files out and so on. We're now fully automated EOD, which is embedded order data. Um, so our acquisitions team, or our collection development team, select or order on our vendors system. Uh, and then magically, through the ether, the orders land into our system with short bibs. When the items are dispatched by the vendor, again, magically, there's a full bib, item records, everything's ready to go, the box of books arrives and it just gets sent up to the shelf. So we have cut out so many staffing bits in acquisitions and their job really is order on the vendor site and then check and pay, authorised to pay, and that's it. Theoretically, obviously there are always issues and there's things that are harder to find and so on. Um, but theoretically, and for the vast majority of our orders, it's that streamlined. And um, so we're really, really pleased with that. Uh, in terms of e-resource, this has really been transformational and we knew it always was going to be because as I mentioned before, we had a plethora of different systems that we had to use to manage e-resources. Um, I've listed them there and we now have one system. So we've so much better integration with acquisitions for a start. They don't have to hop from SFX into Aleph to see was this paid, is that an issue, what's the issue about. Um, and we've more automated statistics gathering and the red light is freaking me out. If you can't see, there's a red light telling me to stop. <laughs> um, 
And we've got more to come there as well. Um, so that's really been transformational to the extent that somebody has retired from our e-resources team and we actually don't think we'll need to replace them. We think we can manage with a one full FTE less because things are so much more streamlined. Uh, I should really stop, but anyway, <laughs> devolution means development. So in terms of staff development, by devolving responsibility to our functional owners, they had to become experts. There was a lot of development in there from, for, for them. Not so much in terms of having to become technical experts, that wasn't needed. It was becoming responsible and having ownership for their system and having confidence that they were the people who'd be bringing the vendor, not any systems team. So that was a good bit of uh, development there. And the other really transformational bit was for staff. So 17 years of one system, 17 years doing the same job, and we have a lot of staff who have been in our place for way more than 17 years, you get stuck in a rut, uh, whether you recognize it as such or not. And just by having to learn a new system, they've been hooshed out of their rut. And uh, not only that, but they've had this huge boost of confidence of, I actually did it. And I have, the first month or two, I had people very, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Now I have people coming up to me going, ah, oh, that's actually great. Yeah, no, and they're, I can see people are proud of themselves that they've managed this huge leap to a new system that's in a very different way and new workflows. So that's pretty transformational, I think. Um, okay. This is our team. Thank you very much to all of the LSP team, some of whom are here. Couldn't have done it without a great team spirit and great work throughout. And just to say that our transformation is ongoing. Um, if you reach for the stars, which we did, you might get to the mountaintop. This is one of my sons who would kill me because he's way older than this now. Um, we feel we probably did get to the mountaintop, but that we still have more and higher mountains to climb. So thank you very much.